rationing under the Rawlings military administration. There was very little fuel, very few cars on the streets, very little by way of modes of transport. I remember I lived close by here at Makula Market. I remember the one day when to get to Ligon, Those were the days. Our university professors in those days, some of them were moonlighting as taxi drivers. Those were the days. Every now and then I'll tell some of my young nephews, I'll say, hey, do you know when I was at University of Ghana, this is the way Ghana was? They say, no, that's impossible. When I say you used to form a line to get toilet paper, soap, milk, they were called essential goods, they say, no, you're lying. So anytime I'm passing by and I see these shops full of uh, uh, provisions and goods, people going in and out, I just smile. I just laugh. I say, you know, the young, you don't know how well you have it. Ghana is a much better place than it used to be. Today, my job is not to reminisce, is not to go back in history, but instead to look forward. I know yesterday, the budget was read, and the person who read the budget was actually my classmate when I was at sixth form at Achimota. Uh, Ken was my classmate, but um, I'm sorry, everybody. I'm not going to say anything about things Ken did when he was in sixth form with me. <laughs> no secrets. They all remain with me. As you all know, Ghana used to be a very, very special place in the world. In the 60s, there were many people all across the world who thought Ghana was the place to be. Martin Luther King, Malcolm X in the United States, when they saw what had happened in Ghana, they were just really impressed because they couldn't do in their civil rights movement what we were doing here in Ghana. They were really, really impressed with us. I have a friend, a white American, Mike Thoyer. What he decided, because he had heard so much about Ghana, he spent his honeymoon here in Ghana in 1960 with his wife. His wife was the first librarian at Baum Library at uh, University of Ghana. Those were the days all across the world. People thought Ghana was the place to be. Just so you all know, I think we can reclaim that. Mine is going to be a talk about our difficulties, yes, but at the end of the day, I think we can reclaim and should reclaim that mantle. We have everything it takes to be the way we used to be. In my research, I began in the agriculture sector, marrying that with technology. Agriculture, I think, is where a lot of potential exists. I'll tell you about my own work in that particular field. But in addition, I also want to tell you that that's a place where there's great history, a place where we can get inspiration. What do I mean by that? In the 1870s, 1870, Ghana was in war. The British were fighting the Ashanti. It was very, very difficult to go up and down in this country. It was a very, very tough time. If you look at war-torn nations in West Africa, that's what Ghana was in 1870. Despite that, there was a market out there, a market for something called cocoa. Ghanaians had never heard of cocoa, and yet they figured out that they could produce cocoa here. Cocoa was invented not in Ghana, but in South America. And our people, despite being in a war-torn nation at that time, created very, very quickly one of the largest industries in cocoa. It was just instantaneous. We had no roads. People would put the cocoa in barrels and roll them all the way from Aquapim and Ashanti region to the coast where they could get money. Those were the days. If we did it then, ladies and gentlemen, I tell you, we can really do it now. Therein lies my optimism, if you will, in the United States, in uh, Ghana. And in the United States, a similar thing happened for their industrialization. Their industrialization also started from agriculture. It was cotton. There was an international market for cotton, and the United States decided to produce a lot of cotton, and it's through that that industrialization took place. And hence, that's why my first stop is in agriculture. I think it's a place with a lot of promise, 
Ghana could be a place that is exceptional in agriculture, and we should think about it. One of the first things I did when working in the agricultural sector, I realized markets didn't exist. Farmers would be on their farms. They would have to wait for traders to come to them. Everything was erratic. Sometimes if a trader doesn't show up on their doorstep, they won't be able to trade anything, and then they'll lose all their produce. So one of the first things we did was to think about a national market for agricultural produce. I know that cocoa is very well taken care of. That was not my concern. My concern was with the other crops, maize, soya, sorghum, etc. And so one of the first things we did was we just decided we're going to A, get technology at work. And so uh, with a company called Isoko, we started experimenting with giving prices to farmers on their mobile phones. But then the bigger thing for us was to create a market, a commodity exchange. And so uh, with a team, we went to lobby the Ghana government to create the Ghana Commodity Exchange, and I, I think it's been in existence for about five years. So that was a consequence of realizing the lack of a commodity exchange in our nation. And don't forget, the Chicago Board of Trade, they had theirs 100 years ago, 150 years ago. Why are we only having ours now? We will need these commodity exchanges if we're going to grow. I'm very impressed with the United Arab Emirates. I go and teach there every spring semester for New York University. They produce no gold, but they have a gold market. They produce no diamonds, but they have a diamond market. They produce no tea, but they have a tea market. We have all these things. We should have those markets. So one of the first things that we did was to try and go and tell the government of Ghana, please set up that market. These markets will create consistent demand. Farmers will benefit because they will know that if they produce their produce, they will definitely get a market. Just as the United States grew through having a consistent market for cotton, just as our ancestors were able to produce uh, cocoa industry because cocoa at that time had consistent market, if we're able to do the same thing for our agricultural produce, it will produce wonders. And so that was one of the first things we did. We've achieved it, it's been done. We're yet to grow it and scale it, but chalk that as something that is positive. It's done, it's there, it's, it's running right now. In the agricultural sector, another blessing we have, I wanna tell everybody, are our MOFA agents, uh, Ministry of Food and Agriculture. They're very good, they're in every community. So as we are scaling up, as we're getting people, uh, farmers, markets, keep that in mind. If there is a negative that we need to be worried about, it's all about our soil. Soil quality is going down, and I'll have more to say about that in a second. One of the main issues with um, agriculture, land rights and land tenure. How do we deal with that? You will hear a lot in my talk today about Kumo. I am from Kumo. That's where I went from one to from five. Uh, Achimota, I was there for sixth form, and again, I thank all my Achimota, uh, lower six, upper six mates. You guys were very, very kind to me. I came from a village school, and you uh, adopted me with open arms. Kumo is a place which has a lot of land. The lands of Kumo are 2% of the land mass of Ghana. There is a forest reserve, which also belongs to Kumo, but right now it's a reserve. If you add that to it, that's 3% of the land mass of Ghana, the Dija Reserve. It's a natural place to perform economic experiments. That's what I've been doing. I've spent a lot of time in Kumo, and so the things that I'm telling you now are things we've actually implemented and we believe can be scaled up nationally and perhaps all across Africa. So back to the question of land tenure. Are we just going to complain about it? Are we going to do something about it? So in Kumu, what we did was that we created a land secretariat. And so within the palace, there's a big Kumu palace there. We cleared up some rooms. I got my team together. And then we digitized all the formal leases we could find. 
And so those people who had registered their lands, we got all of them, we digitized them, we scanned them, and we put them on a master map. For all the people who we couldn't have or couldn't find formal leases, we have these apps. They're on your mobile phone. You take the app and you just walk around the boundary of your farm, okay? And just at the end of that, we've got a map of your farm. And so we've done that essentially for the entire 2% of the land mass of Ghana. Whatever we could, we did. So our office now, I'm very proud to say, handles all of the land issues in Kumu. I'm very, very happy to say every now and then there'll be people, you know, there are land disputes in Ghana all the time. Two people are about to kill each other because this one says we've encroached my land. We'll bring them to our office. We'll show them the maps. And then one of them will realize, oh, I'm sorry. It's actually not my land. My land is a little bit this way. Then everything solved. Those cases where there's overlapping land, we have 2% of the land mass of Ghana. And so we just say, don't worry. This may have been an error. Somebody gave you a piece of land, didn't know it was overlapping yours. Come to us. We'll give you another plot of land. And so there's been quite a bit of peace because we set up this land secretariat in Kumu. We are now going to the next phase. And so what we're doing right now is we've created a Kumu Development and Investment Foundation, which will be the holder of the land on behalf of the people. And we're open for business. We want to see gentlemen and gentlewomen. We want to see the youth going back into agriculture. Anybody who wants a piece of land, come talk to me. We got 2% of the land mass of Ghana, okay? I've got a lot of land, all right? So come, come and talk to me. We'll give you some land. Our goal for the Kumo area of, is, of course, economic development. But we also believe that that place could be part of what could be Ghana's breadbasket. I see no reason why Ghana should not be a major exporter of grains to the West African subcontinent. And so what we're doing right now is proof of concept. If we can do it in the Kumo area, we can do it anywhere. By the way, um, just for the record, uh, I would like to thank my research um, uh, folks, uh, Center for Technology and Economic Development. And I also want to put in that this is not a big NGO-operated thing. It's not a big World Bank uh, operation. We've just got the local people together, and we're trying to make things work. Some will at this stage say, hey, Yao, what is this business of Ghana Commodity Exchange? We want to talk about industrialization. We want big factories. It's all of this stuff that you're doing. Isn't it just tiny and small stuff? I completely disagree. I remember many years ago talking to the CEO of a company called Blue Sky. Many of you may know the uh, company. Uh, the man, uh, Anthony Pyle, is his name. And so we had a small seminar with him. And we were talking about industrialization. He had an industry. And he was very, very upset. I said, why are you upset? I don't have consistent supplies of, in his case, uh, mangoes and citrus. And therefore, he couldn't expand his industry because there wasn't that consistent supply. If we get these markets in order, everything will be systematized. And so companies will know from this market you're always going to get consistent supplies. Some farmers will have low supplies, some will have high supplies, but on average, the market will be producing something for you which is consistent, okay? And so you actually need these markets as a precursor to any industrialization. To just stand there and say, I'm going to build these tall factories, and just if we had great politicians who would just come, that's not the way it works. It, not, it did not work that way in the United States. It will never work that way in Ghana. Uh, by the way, I should also say the Ghana Commodity Exchange, we've also created nano versions of that, smaller versions within the communities themselves. Again, all of these things are meant to be proof of concept. If they work, we'll translate them to the rest of Ghana, hopefully to the rest of West Africa. I had mentioned uh, climate change. Um, and I would mentioned that I work in the spring semester in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, they are the headquarters of uh, COP28. And so I think at the end of this month, there are these big meetings, COP28. Uh, Ghana is the co-president, I hear. Um, I've read, and they've been doing a lot of things uh, with that. What is...
climate change mean for Kamo? What does it mean for Ghana? On the one hand, I can tell you when I'm working with my farmers, they are very worried about erratic water supply, uh, rain, rainfall, okay? It used to be very, very consistent. Now sometimes it comes early, sometimes it comes late. That's climate change for you. So it's something that we are watching. It's something which is of concern. On the other side, you all understand decarbonization and what's going on on the planet, and in particular, the fact that in many advanced nations, there are limits on the production of carbon. And so if a company in Switzerland or the United, uh, United Kingdom wants to open a factory, they need to purchase carbon credits. We in Ghana, in Africa, can produce those credits. When you build trees, those trees will suck some of the carbon out, and you can get a credit from it. And so, we are at, in Kumu, and I recommend that for the whole of the country, are investing heavily in understanding these carbon markets. The area that we're working in right now, when I was much younger, used to be full of animals. There were elephants there, there were leopards there. Uh, these days, when I go there and I talk to my, um, uh, my aunt and the older folks, they're scared. They say, hey, you're going to drop on so isn't that the place with all the animals? They say, Prof, yeah, you're going to be eaten up by a lion. And meanwhile, if you go there today, there's nothing like that. It's almost like a golf course because they've, all the trees are gone. So with this carbon credits, maybe we can rebuild these trees, get the climate a bit more consistent, and in addition, make some money. Because if you put up the trees, you get carbon credits, which is worth something. So this is income. And by the way, we got 2% of the land mass of Ghana, so we're going to get 2% of the income, right? Okay. As we were working with our farmers, one of the constraints we found had to do with credit. So we were expecting a lot of our farmers to come to our exchanges, Ghana Commodity Exchange and our nano version, in droves. Because I'm the economist. I had done research to figure out that the problem was with markets. And so we'll call and talk to the farmers, and everybody says, this is a great idea, go for it. And at the day of the market itself, you see the farmers a little bit timid. I said, my friend, you told me this was a good idea. You said you wanted to bring your commodities in there. Why aren't you doing it? They wouldn't say anything. Timid and quiet. And so this went on for several months. And so then I went into the field, and I said, look, guys, you guys are messing up on my experiments here. I'm a professor. I need to write some academic papers on this. And I'm not getting any results. What the heck is going on? So then they revealed to me their secret. I should have known about it, but I didn't. Many of these farmers are in debt. At the beginning of the season, they have no money to buy the seeds, clear the land, or anything. So what they do is they go to traders. And many of you should know the traders are women. The farmers are men, and the men are complaining about the women that they need to get money from them. I just love it, you know, uh, gender issues, wonderful. So we found out that these traders, the terms of the contract are such that the farmers will get money in return for, number one, sending a certain quantity of maize to them at the end of the season in return for the money that was given. And two, even the rest of the farm, for which they didn't get a loan, has to be given to the same trader. We've computed the implied interest rate because they get the maize based on a tiny bit of CDs today. And later on, the price is, of course, way higher, right? And so the, ex the interest rate is huge. Some of them are getting 100%, 200% interest. So that's one of the things that we found. We started talking to our uh, local banks. Hey, here's an opportunity. If these wonderful women are able to go into the communities and give out loans, there are very, very few um, defaults among them because they strategically figure out which farmer to go to, and they just watch the farmer. So their default rate is very, very low. So our financial people, why aren't you in there? What's going on? I think during the discussion time, we have some finance people on our team, so we'll have a wonderful conversation. So, uh, we've been working a lot on uh, agriculture, and as I said, for me, this is a growth area. We'll continue working on it. I've showed you some of the things that we've done 
in that regard. We continue working on it, and hopefully you will hear back from us soon. I encourage the entire nation to do the same thing. Uh, as yesterday um, the budget was read, and I was talking to some taxi drivers, uh, my own driver, and a few other people, and I said, hey, did you listen to the budget? I said, no. I said, why not? Oh, a lot of technical stuff there. I said, okay, but don't you care about it? Yes, I care about the price of food. I care about the price of maize, bread, eggs. If we get our agriculture right, at least at the uh, lower income levels, you're going to get a lot of people very, very happy. It will bring more stability to this place, and so I encourage you all to think about that. The other area that we've been worried about, concerned about, and our chair is a chief uh, from the village very, very close to mine. Uh, I am from Kumu, as I said, and I, am, I was made a chief there. I am the Abwa Fohene of the Kumu Traditional Council. It's something that gives me a lot of pride. Every Akwesi day, I go back to Kumu, and as you know, the tradition with Akwesi day is you pour libation on the stools of the old chiefs, okay? And so any stool, any chief that died on the stool gets a real stool, blackened, you pour libation on it. Those guys who were destooled, well, they get bottles. They don't get the real blackened stool. <laughs> Some of these stools are 300 years old. And so when we go at Akweside in Kumu, you begin with the first chief, Trivo Kudia. Most of you have heard of him from uh, history. Then you go to uh, uh, Ochibafo, then you go to this, then you go to this, all the way to the most recent chief. That's what we do every six weeks. Isn't that an amazing culture? Isn't it amazing that you have places with a history 300 years old? What we've decided in Kumu is to transform that wonderful history and the pageantry that goes around it into business. We are creating a tourism center for Kumu. And so there are a number of palaces all over the place, beginning with the Kumu Palace itself, the Bodmasti Palace. At Bodriasi, there's this wonderful 150-year-old palace which still maintains the original Ashanti architecture. There are no nails in it. There's no cement in it, but it's still standing. When I send my architects, uh, Cecil Abbey and his team, Julian, when they go there to see it, they're in awe of the traditions of our own people 150 years ago. So we're showcasing all of these heritage sites. We got a little bit of money to open some art galleries beside each of them. Our students are now, uh, uh, secondary students are now working on it. So the goal is to transform our heritage and the beauty of our history into money. So we've started the first phase. Slowly we're going to get our uh, tourists coming in. Tourism is very important. I remember reading the book by Lee Kuan Yew in the development of Singapore. And he said, in the 60s, as you all know, Singapore had the same GDP per capita as Ghana. When he was going through his drive to change Singapore, the first thing he did was tourism. Why? Business people, when they set foot on your country, the first thing they do is to go to your hotels. During their free time, they go to your galleries or museums or whatever artistic things that you have there. Do that first, and you get a lot of these business people feeling very, very comfortable coming into your country. There are some things we need to do. Please, let's make coming into Ghana easier. Our visa situations are still too difficult. A uh, big shout out to the team in New York, the consular office. They're doing great there. Uh, I work a lot with them. But again, you guys are going to hate me for saying this. What's wrong with allowing United States citizens to come here without a visa, despite the fact that when we are going over there, they give us a lot of grief? <laughs> do we want to develop or do we not want to develop? That's the question we ask ourselves. So I'm just challenging you all. We need to change our laws. And if we want to go ahead, there's some sacrifices in our pride that we need to do. I have invested a lot 
in a secondary school, and I'm encouraging them to do a lot of art. Art is another one of the successful areas of, um, of Ghana. We have famous uh, Ella Natri, uh, is in, um, I think he's being exhibited at the Tate Gallery right now in London. Um, a young man, Amwako Boafo, uh, is a big sensation. I was looking online. He has some of these paintings. It's about this, by this. And you know one of those paintings? Three million dollars. Not bad, huh? Just a painting. It's like this and then like that, okay? And so we are also telling our kids in Kumo, invest in painting. On that note, I've mentioned in Kumo a lot, education is extremely important. I am here talking to you guys today because I got educated. There's a secondary school, the secondary school that I went to, we're investing in that with my colleague, uh, uh, Roland Akosa and uh, Robert Dansobwachi, they're sitting over there. Uh, the three of us and another two uh, formed a foundation and we are supporting the school as much as we can. Uh, encouraging the students and as I said, we started an art program with them. Universities are also very, very important. I remember when I was uh, leaving Ghana, when uh, I think he's also in Accra, Patrick Awua was starting his university, uh, Ashesi University. Those were the days when there were only three universities in Ghana. And I kid you not, during that, those days, to form a new university in Ghana required a huge amount of wrangling with the ministry. For some reason, private universities were not allowed. I am very, very happy to see so many private universities in Ghana today. Some of them are great. Some of them are not so great. Bring them all on. Let the people decide which ones they want to go to, and let's have a competition in the universities. And so that's a, a good thing. I'm looking at the time now. How much time do I have, sir? Keep going. All right. I hope I'm not getting people terribly uh, angry at me. Ghana needs to engage in the world. We are 35 something million people. Relative to the population of the world, that is tiny. We need to engage in the world. One of the best ways we engage in the world is for our people to go into the world. There is nothing wrong with our skilled people going to other countries for jobs. There is absolutely nothing wrong about that. Too many times I hear the word brain drain. We are losing our doctors, we are losing our nurses. I don't think that's right. First of all, there's something counterintuitive that I'd like to say. There are people who would say, for example, we are losing all of our doctors because they're going abroad. We are losing all of our nurses because they're going abroad. I once saw a report, I won't tell you by which institution, they actually said, let's make the standards of our doctors a little bit lower so that they can't travel abroad and get the brain drain. On the contrary, I believe, and our economic analysis has shown, hear me out, if you allow people to leave, if many people think that there's a chance they could leave and get large amounts of money outside, then many more people go into that field in the first place. So that after those who want to leave have actually left, those you have left behind in Ghana is a larger number than if you didn't allow people to leave. People have to spend the time and energy to go into a field. It's costly in terms of money, in terms of their time. If many of them know that there's a chance, not 100%, but maybe 50%, that they'll go abroad, then those people will go into the system. Those people who are saying right now that our nurses, we should prevent them from going abroad, are making a mistake. Let them out. And probably you'll find we'll have in Ghana even more nurses. So again, as a nation of 30-something million people, we have to engage with the rest of the world. We will not grow unless we engage with the world. We cannot do things by ourselves. We should not do things by ourselves. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to let people leave. Let's encourage it. You would not be seeing me here if people said, Prof, you can't leave. In fact, in my years, we actually had to have an exit visa to leave Ghana. Those were the days. I will mention, as an economist, 
we have something called the youth dividend. So a large number of our people in Africa and definitely in Ghana are below the age of 19 or 20. This is something that needs to be managed well. This is something we need to be very, very careful about. One of the things we're doing in Kumo right now is encouraging some of our youth to go onto our farms, the 2%. We are going to start getting leases, small leases, and helping some of these young people start up their farms. Young people like technology, and at our center, we've got lots and lots of technology. So we're trying to marry those things together. I told you about the museums that we have and the art facilities so that we can increase the liveliness of the small town called Kumo. So that's one of the things we are doing. We encourage the rest of the nation to do the same thing. I think my time is slowly moving, so let me just uh, make a few, five minutes more. Okay. I mentioned to you that I spent half of my semester, my, half of my year in the United Arab Emirates. United Arab Emirates obtained their independence in the early 70s. If you had seen them at that time, the place was a complete desert. Nothing there. Sand, one or two buildings. What they decided to do was to make their nation an economic hub. All of you have heard of Dubai, Emirates. Now many Africans go to Dubai to have that place be the headquarters of their building. Emirates Airlines has become a national airline for Africa. If you want to go from Angola to Ghana, maybe you pass through Dubai. Ghana to Kenya, pass through Dubai. Ghana should be doing the same thing. Ghana has many, many natural advantages. We speak English. My friends in Angola, they're trying to change away from Portuguese to English. How many nations trade in Portuguese? Very few, and it's a big struggle for them. We already have that English. We should create Ghana, a Ghana which is an economic hub for West Africa. Some of the things we need to do, I know there's been a lot of progress on our ports and harbors. We need to speed that up. It has to be that if you want to trade in Africa, you go to Ghana, because Ghana ports efficient, 100%. Our road system, let's make it efficient. Our harbors, efficient. Ease of doing businesses. If you want to set up a company in Ghana, it should be as easy as possible. One day, you've got it. Our youth need to be skilled. Technology is going to be important. I should mention, uh, many of you have know of the revolution in AI, chat GPT. Uh, if in the United Arab Emirates, everybody is going into data science. That's the wave of the future. So for my youth, that's what I recommend all of you do. Let me conclude. Two things in conclusion. Number one, you may have noticed I barely said anything about the budget. I think we are way too preoccupied with macro numbers. I looked at the budget. I am a trained economist. I have a PhD in economics. But sometimes the numbers just fly by. What do they mean? 1.5 versus 1.7, 3.5 versus 3.8. If you're in the Ministry of Finance, extremely important. But if we're looking at the development of Ghana, I would maintain we need to go back to our microeconomics, not our macroeconomics. We need structural change in this country. We need to change the way we do things. We need to go back to the ground and transform things. We need to build our farms. We need to build our firms. We need to build our tourist facilities. That's what we need to do, and that's what I've tried to say here. Finally, to conclude, final, final conclusion, I envision a very prosperous Ghana, a Ghana that is hooked up to the world. Ghanaians are going back and forth to Sierra Leone, to Liberia, to New York, to Dubai, business. People in those countries are doing businesses in Ghana. Some people, maybe in the United States, will decide they want to work in Kenya. And what they'll do is they'll use Ghana as a base. Perhaps they even never set foot in Ghana, but they have a company here because electronically and digitally, you can set up a company. You've got your money. And so somebody in the United States can use Ghana as a base 
to trade with Kenya even without coming to Ghana. That's the future I envision. I believe that if we change our structure, we can go back to the days when, as in the 1960s, people thought of Ghana as the place to be. Oh, Ghana, that's that wonderful place where the people are so nice. In the evenings, I just walk around and it just feels so good. Business is wonderful. Tourist facilities are great. The youth are very smart. That's the Ghana I envisioned. And ladies and gentlemen, I really believe and you can tell because I've invested my time and energy in that, we can achieve that. We should achieve that. We will achieve that. Thank you and God bless. A round of applause for Professor <laughs> Prof, thank you very much. That was an illuminative and expansive address. Thank you. Now we go straight into our panel discussion. And joining Prof on stage for further discussions, today we have three extremely knowledgeable gentlemen. Our first panelist has over three decades of banking and financial management experience. He started his banking career with SGSSB and has held executive positions in multinational banks, including Standard Chartered, Barclays Bank, and Stanbic Ghana, where he was chief executive officer for 14 years. He sits on various boards, including Goldfields and the Teachers Fund. He is currently the executive chairman of LDS Africa, an enterprise development firm, and is also the chief of the Pishigu traditional area in the Dagon Kingdom. He's a proud alum of Ghana Secondary School Tamale and Tamale Secondary School. Ladies and gentlemen, help me to welcome Na Dr. Al Hassan Andani. <laughs> Our next panelist. He's a distinguished figure in the financial world with a remarkable three decade long career in the banking sector. Notably, he served as the managing director and CEO of Cal Bank PLC for an impressive 20 year tenure, demonstrating exemplary leadership and expertise. Beyond his finance and business acumen, he holds prominent positions on various boards such as being chairman and co-founder of Roman Ridge School. He has had a remarkable career trajectory that serves as a testament to his exceptional leadership, financial acumen, commitment to sustainability, and unwavering dedication to make a positive impact across various aspects of society. Please help me welcome, currently the president of the Achimota Golf Club, and a proud Adadier of Presec Legon, eight times champions, the very accomplished Mr. Frank Edu Jr. And now, our moderator panelist, he wears two hats. He's the Chief Executive Officer of Petra, a leading diversified financial services institution in Ghana with activities in pension trusteeship, personal financial planning, securities brokerage, and fund administration. He's also a co-founder and executive director of Achieve, a fintech business that aims to conveniently provide quality financial services to every African. He holds a bachelor's and a master's degree in computer science from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and MIT and an MBA from Harvard Business School. He is a proud Akura and was senior prefect of his graduating class in Achimoto School. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Akura Kofifin. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Elizabeth Irene, my senior. <laughs> um, it's an honor to be here and to hopefully lead this conversation uh, in a direction that um, does justice to the topic that, um, that we have been given. Nana Prof, thank you very much for your submission. I think we've all learned a lot about Kumewu today. <laughs> Let me just, um, just make a disclaimer, a small one, in that I'm sure most of you were expecting Bell Amundi to be playing this role. I'm sorry to disappoint you, and hopefully I can do a good job of guiding these distinguished gentlemen towards uh, the conclusions that we're looking for in this conversation. The topic today, Ghana, a country in crisis, defining a new economic direction. Nana Prof, you've been tackling some of these issues in pilot in Kumeu. So I'm going to try to summarize your presentation to make sure that I understood it and that we all are on the same page. Specifically in Kumeu, you've led the organization of land that provides clarity around ownership and property rights. This has allowed the land to be aggregated, hopefully, for automation and mechanization. To complete the work started there, there has to be a focus on establishing markets for equipping farmers. And we have found some challenges in financing those value chains. So if I were to generalize this, I would say that as a nation, we should target our existing national assets, the ones that we know we have as a, an important part of our developmental agenda. And by organizing the value chains where we have competitive advantage, we've identified agri and tourism, we can accelerate our, our development. Have I captured that appropriately? Thank you very much. Before we delve into those recommendations further, let me turn to our two distinguished panelists, my seniors. As we're setting off, I think it is important that we establish where we're starting from. So I'm going to delve into the other aspect of the topic that we're dealing with. There's a path for economic development, but are we a nation in crisis today? And I'll, stand with, I'll start with Mr. Frankie. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, good evening, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I wish I could say fellow across. <laughs> Unfortunately, my father won't allow me to go to Achimoto school because he was a, stout, a staunch Presbyterian. Are we a nation in crisis? To all, in, to all intents and purposes, I believe so. And whilst today is not a day for lamentations, we are indeed a nation in crisis. And I say so because it's, it's glaring, it's obvious. We've had, we're out of the capital markets. Cocoa board is not firing. You know, we have a difficult economic situation. So yes, we are a nation in crisis. Nah, Danny. Are we a nation in crisis? Nana Chairman, I was actually wondering why when you were presenting, you weren't wearing glasses. And uh, you read without your glasses. And I was told even Otun Ford doesn't wear glasses. So I'm wondering whether there's some type of chip tendency with the eyes. So <laughs> you have to teach. Uh, Nana Chair, you know, I accepted to be on this platform because the topic suggested that it's only at Chimortans that could put a topic like this. It's, are we a nation in crisis? And Achimota, to say Achimota speaks was a platform created on the 90th anniversary of the school. And given what Achimota has done for Ghana and the world, I think you have enough firepower to protect anybody who says what he wants to say on this platform. <laughs> if I'm taking to the court, 
there must be a Chimotan judges that who can get me out. <laughs> Are we a nation in crisis? When I heard the introductory remarks of our distinguished uh, speaker, uh, walking from, from uh, Makola to um, Ligon and queuing for essential commodities, and today any number of Uber cars can take you to or any number of shops can give you whatever you want. I thought that was a conclusion that we're not a nation in crisis. But I differ that we're a nation in crisis. And I also had to wait very patiently for him for his last concluding statement to know that we're a nation in crisis. And, um, and, and I'm sure we'll come back to a lot of the subjects that he said, but I think that if you go back again, Prof, to the compact countries of Malaysia, Korea, at the time of independence, and what they've been able to achieve. And to imagine that Malaysia, Singapore, some of them took some of their early development plans from Ghana. And you see where they are today, compared to where Ghana is today. Clearly, we're a nation in crisis. And also, I, on your concluding remarks, you know, that you didn't make any references to the budget because we spent too much time on the macros. And I agree completely with you because I always ask the question, do you do economics or you talk economics? In Ghana, we talk a lot of economics. But I've been long enough in the financial sector to know you do economics. So we're a nation in crisis because I don't think we do enough economics. Thank you, thank you very much. But, <laughs> let, let, me, let me challenge that a little bit and ask if we're not being too harsh. And let's look at some numbers, historically and comparatively. We entered the Fourth Republic in 1992. And from then until 2021, our GDP per capita has grown by about 500% as a country. And when we compare it to the 20 years before that, we grew by 75%. And this has been within our democratic dispensation. If we compare with other countries in that same period from 92 to 2001, uh, West African neighbors, Cote d'Ivoire, grew by 193%, Nigeria by 300%. And we don't compare too unfavorably to East Africa, where Kenya grew by 525, Tanzania by 543. We're at 500. In that same period, Malaysia grew by 248%. So, are we not just going through a temporary blip? Is this something that is structural that should worry us? Mr. Edu. I was hoping you would go with the <laughs> non Nandi first. Are we in a temporary crisis or is it structural? First and foremost, as I think as Ghanaians, we, we must... Um, collectively decide what we are prepared to live for, fight for, and die for. Otherwise, we are going nowhere. And I, I don't think that essentially our problems are economic. I think our problems are birthed in our governance structure. And successively, we haven't had leaders, we have had rulers. Because leaders profile a vision, galvanize the people to follow, to achieve that vision. In my 61 years, I do not think that I have come across in this country a leader with vision. We have, as Nandani said, we, we talk economics, but it's all platitudes. And we are not generally mobilizing the resources, the human capital, everything else, the spirit of the nation to drive this nation forward, to encourage people. We have lost 
their self without you know we, we, we simply do not seem to care what is driving us as a people what is galvanizing us what is mobilizing us you know um, and so I think that our, we have a, a crisis of governance because today the system that we have fortunately um, the leader of the consultative committee is our chairman created a system of governance which I find difficulty accepting. There are, various, there are various types of democracy. I have not come across any economy which developed through universal adult suffrage. Not one European country developed using one man, one vote. They developed under kingdoms and fiefdoms. Even in the U.S., it is still not one man, one vote. It's 40 acres and a mule. So why do we think that in Africa we can develop using universal adult suffrage? We have the NDC and the MPP. They are laws unto themselves. Every eight years, we change them. But we have politicians calling themselves leaders who are first, they think of themselves first, individual first, family second, party third, and if you are lucky, the nation fourth. You can share with Google from Pondia Sembeba. I think, Honorable, this is Honorable Sosu. Nice to meet you, sir. <laughs> so, we, we, if, I, if we don't fix our governance structure, I don't think the economics will work. That is my simple, humble opinion. Thank you. So, so the answer then is that you don't think it is enough what we have achieved? No. I don't think so. I mean, you're talking about GDP per capita having yes. grown increased by 500%. It's nominal. What, I mean, what, what number is that? If I take the value of my savings in 1983 when I came out of university, where it was probably maybe 100 CDs at the time, and what I have in the bank today, even if it's a hundred thousand or one million CDs. What is the value of that one million CDs today to that one hundred one hundred CDs then? When I came out of university, East Legon land was sold for three thousand CDs. My national service salary was eight hundred and fifty CDs. So I was potentially a, a possible investor in real estate out of university forty years ago. You know? So I, I think that these are numbers that people just throw about to to feel good, you know, and to secure votes. <laughs> Point well taken. I think, I think my good fortune has always been um, Frank and myself. So Frank is fire and I'm water. <laughs> They're all very destructive, but one is hot and the one is cold. So, um, I, I would say that any institution that cannot effectively self-regulate is doomed for failure. Any institution, whether it's a company, whether it's your own house, your company, or your country, if you cannot effectively self-regulate, you are doomed for failure. So let's ask whether Ghana, as we are cons currently constituted, it's an institution that is effectively self-regulating. If your answer is yes, then you're on the path to growth. But if the answer is no, which I think is no, then we are doomed for failure. And we've got to fundamentally rethink. But if I go back to your question on those massive GDP growth, and I come back to Prof and my famous quote, due to economics, 
or you talk economics. And growth for who? Economic GDP growth for who? If we take the multinational companies in this country, and I know the banking sector very well, been there for years, those multinational banks and multinational companies control easily with my eyes closed 70% of those massive GDPs. That's not for you. That's not for the rank and file Ghanaian. So please, if you go back to India or Malaysia, those GDP growth are for Malaysians. Not, yeah, there's foreign capital there, but a significant portion of it is in Malaysia. And I think back to ju just doing economics and not talking economics. And Prof, for all your examples somehow, I stayed too long in the industry and with too many companies that some of the stories come home. Kumeu, if you go and look at the records, there's a company called Kifcom. I don't know whether your research showed you Kifcom. One, Kumeu, Kume, Kifcom stands for Kumeu Industrial Farm Complex. That was the biggest agri investment in Ghana during Liman's administration. I was in SSB. A consortium of banks were brought together to finance Kumeu. Kifcom. Kifcom is a case study because we had institutions that could not self regulate. Kifcom died. Good luck to the institutions that you are trying to clear, but let's make sure it can self regulate. I just give another quick example to talk in economics and not doing economics. You talked about input credit, where market women will come and give your farmers money and they have to give return in food produce, and even what is in excess of the loan, they have to still sell to the woman. I worked in SSB, and SSB ran an input credit scheme in the upper region over the Via and Tono projects. If you ask anybody in agriculture in our part of the world, the most secure form of agriculture is irrigated farming. So between Via and Tono, was 8,000 hectares, till today is there, of irrigated land. There was FASCOM, Farmer Services Company. There was Irrigation Company of Upper Region. There was uh, uh, Polugu Tomato Factory. Those systems worked. I indeed was a project manager for SSB, regional project manager for SSB between 1987 and 1990, running that scheme. Running that scheme. Ladies and gentlemen, that scheme was put together by a British company called Tate and Lyle. So Tate and Lyle was the central pivot at ICO, ICO running the system. And when I say Tate and Lyle, you might think there's no entire British establishment. They brought only two gentlemen. The MD was called Mr. Quimby, and the finance controller was called Mr. Booth. And they ran the system effectively. And the place was booming. I bought my first TV from selling tomatoes as a bank manager. When we handed the institution over from Tate and Lyle to Irrigation Development Company of Ghana, the system collapsed. <laughs> so any institution that cannot effectively self-regulate itself will fail. Is Ghana self-regulating? Our Industries, whatever we're setting up, is it self regulated? And I can see you are trying to stop me. Let yeah. me finish with that. <laughs> Prof, you mentioned, um, you mentioned um, Mr. Anthony Pyle. Tony Pyle is a very good friend of mine. Again, when you spend too long in this industry, uh, you have a lot of friends. You know everybody. He was a retired captain in the British Army. So when he finished his service, he came to do uh, agriculture in Ghana. His first project was a 4.5 million pound project. Then I was sitting in Standard Chartered Bank with a consultant called Mr. Charles Park. When Charles came and we looked through the company, I told him that this won't work. Let's scale it down. So we scaled it down to 250,000 pounds, and he worked to work with Mr. Safo, Safo Combine. Remember Combine Farms? Patricia Safo was their partner. This is a white company. Systems work. Today, 
it's a success story. So you see the difference. Meanwhile, combined farms is collapsed. But combined farms is the one on which Blue Sky Products was built. That is institutions that are able to self-regulate and institutions that are unable to self-regulate. We can expand that to a situation in Ghana. Are we a nation that is able to self-regulate? And all those beautiful GDP growth numbers, are they for Ghanaians? Or where are we going? Who's, whose growth is that? <laughs> Understood. <laughs> Prof. Our bankers are throwing a challenge to you. Let me, let me add a little bit more to that. So your model looks at starting from agriculture, and Mr. Andani has talked about some of our agriculture examples and why he thinks there's a challenge. Right? It looks at starting in agriculture, moving along the value chain, effectively capturing more of the value chain as you go along towards development. If we look at Coco, you gave the example of success in Coco. We are still, I believe, the second largest producer of cocoa in the country. Financing in the world, sorry. Financing of cocoa is done through Cocoa Board. Inputs are provided. Farmers can get to market. And yet, the progression along the value chain hasn't happened. If we have not been able to do that in the cocoa sector, how can we do that in any other sector that we have identified. What is stopping us? I think our, our two other panelists have looked at it from a leadership perspective. They've given some indications. Is that what it is, or are there other things that are preventing the diamond that we have from being the example to prove your proposal? Okay, so... Um Thank you for this question, and I think um, one of the great things about being a tenured professor is that you can't be fired unless you do something really bad. I am going to say something to you folks now which could get me into a lot of trouble, but I think as an academic, you have to tell the truth, okay? So, number one, uh, the question is about how come we have so much cocoa and we don't have chocolate. You'll see statements about the value added of choc you look at a chocolate bar, what percentage of it goes to Ghana? Tiny. So again, hopefully I'm gonna keep my job after this statement. I went to a town called Hershey, Pennsylvania. That's where they make chocolate. And I asked the folks there, why did you locate your company in Hershey, Pennsylvania? And the guy said, look outside. I looked outside, all I could see is grass. And he says, because of the cattle, to make the milk that goes into the chocolate. You see, cocoa, uh, chocolate is not only cocoa. It's many other things. Milk is the key ingredient. And last I checked, we don't have a milk industry here in Ghana. We don't produce milk. In addition to milk, the next biggest import, input into chocolate is marketing. You have to package it in a particular way to appeal to certain people in the market in which you're working in. We don't have a comparative advantage in that. I see, I was reading the other day, some government reports saying exactly this. We need to get into ch uh, chocolate manufacturing. The only thing that caught my eye about that Ghana uh, report is that it was made in 1929. <laughs> so in 1929, people were worrying about Ghana being able to make chocolate. And we're in 2023 today, and we're still asking ourselves exactly the same thing. Why? If we're able to make chocolate, great. But it's not the only things we can do. It's not the only thing we should be worried about. Let's try different things. Some will work, some will not work. Let me go to Kifcom. 
Kivkom, as I understand it, was a big uh, project. I uh, got a lot of money, and my understanding, I may be wrong, you'll, you'll tell me on that. I think it was the Yugoslavians were involved with it in those years. And it's just, it was an attempt to do something, but it failed. Somebody told me actually that some of the machines they brought, and here I may be getting myself into other kinds of trouble, were actually snow plows that they used in Yugoslavia, and they brought to Como to do the agriculture. Of course it's not going to work. Again, Kivcom is before, be, before my time. I don't know what the details are. Just that what we need to do is to try different things. Some things will work and some things will be a failure. We keep moving forward. What I'm doing in Kumo, frankly, could fail. And that's fine. At least I'm experimenting. I'm trying something. I'm doing economics, okay? If it succeeds, great. If it doesn't succeed, that's okay. But we keep trying different things. And this thing about cocoa, we actually have some very good and very strong uh, cocoa uh, companies and manufacturing companies. But why, as a nation, we keep bringing this up? Just makes no sense to me. A hundred years, and we're still talking about it. Where's our milk? Where's our marketing? Where are all the other things? When cocoa came here the first time, we weren't using it. And I think, you know, uh, when it came during the time of the motor car, and so when it came in the 1780s, eight, uh, 1790s, people thought they used the cocoa to make petrol. That's what everybody thought. But they still made it because it was making money. They didn't care that they didn't have an integrated industry. No, no if problem. it works, it works. But how is that different from any of the other value chains that you're talking about? I think that's where, because this is one that we know. So you've described it perfectly. We understand that the inputs are uh, milk and this and that. As a nation, that has a strong dominant position in it, just like we have the land, just like we have the tourism. Why are we not able to move along and become more productive in a value chain that is natural to us? Is it because of what Frank and Nandani are talking about, that at the level of the nation, the leadership is lacking? so that in Kumewu we could actually achieve something, but at a national level in Ghana, let's forget it. Is that what it is? Yeah. So, 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 so there are two things here, both of which are important. One of which I know something about, the other I'll defer a little bit. Uh, the first thing is that economies grow through freedom. People need to be free to produce what they think is the right thing. The British uh, in the 1870s actually said Ghana should produce coffee. And so if you go around, there are coffee plantations all over the place. Ghana was not well suited for producing coffee. So all those enterprises became a failure. The cocoa, we all talk, tell the story of Tete Kwashi. Why did Tete Kwashi have to steal uh, cocoa pods from Fernando Po and smuggle them in here? Why? Because the British didn't want him to do that. He smuggled it in here. And despite the fact that the British didn't want him to produce it, we produced in Ghana a great cocoa industry. So very important here is freedom. We should do the, um, create the structures so that people can decide what the right thing is to produce. Governments should not be choosing the winners. Governments should uh, set the framework up and allow the very good people of Ghana to decide what the right things are. And so that's the, main th that's the main thing I want to say here. If we haven't been successful in cocoa, uh, in chocolate manufacturing, maybe there's some reasons for it. Those who are in the, in the business, they're doing very well. Keep going. But government's role should be to set the uh, playing field well and allow idea. I don't know what the next big thing is going to be. Nobody knows what the next thing is going to be. In the 1870s, the British didn't know what the right thing is going to be. So for us to be here and constantly talk, this is now talking economics, yes. okay? talk <laughs> about cocoa or chocolate, I think it's the wrong thing. Let's go out there and do economics. I am trying something in Kumo and I may fail. That's fine. I think that there is something out there where we can become a breadbasket in maize and in soil. Give me the chance to try it. If I fail, I fail. But I could succeed. I think I'm going to succeed. Okay. I think I think uh, that um, we should all applaud Prof for trying. You know, because.
unfortunately, again, in Ghana, the people who have the mic, the people who have the radio stations and TV stations, have become the voices that we listen to. And these people know from archaeology to zoology, but they have never tried anything. And I think we should applaud Prof for trying. But, you know, Prof, when it comes to the Cocoa Valley chain, Ghana has tried, albeit with very little success. So there's CPC. And yes, I agree with Hershey. Um, you need the milk. But we have the pampas of Argentina, where livestock is, is rampant. We have the Accra Plains. For whatever reason, we have never developed that livestock industry. And so the value chain of cocoa remains stunted. CPC is nothing to write home about. And again, depending, and if you go to CPC, I'll give it to them, they have co chocolate with cocoa content from 10% all the way to 70%. Okay. Hershey will do 5% and put a lot of sugar and milk in it because that's what they've marketed. So it's, it's, another, it's a whole different. But value chain, again, is not a matter of circumstance. Like all development, it's, it is contrived. It is deliberate. If you go to Mauritius, Mauritius survived on tourism and sugarcane. So sugarcane seizing, you see all these sugarcane um, ash all over the place. Goes into people's living rooms, offices, and it's fine. But they don't waste anything. The steering wheel of your car is, from sugar, is made from sugarcane waste. The core of it is the last bit of sugar cane. After they've burnt it, they've ground it, etc. Extracted sugar, molasses, everything out of it. Then the chaff is glued, formed into a sphere, and then coated and put on a Lamborghini and sold for two hundred thousand dollars. That is the kind of thing that we need here in this country. We have to have leadership which should direct us and lead us to these efforts, because there's value chain in it. Mauritius today is a center for the refining of gold. How is it? They don't have gold. You know, so why is it that up to today we have sat here, 175 years after gold mining, we still do not process gold in this country. But I'd like to say something that many, many years ago, and may his kind soul rest in peace, I was speaking to um, Senior Minister J.H. Mensah. And that was something that I wanted to take through government. And he made a very significant statement. He says, you know, government, if you bring it, we'll spoil it. <laughs> <laughs> on, on that note, we're going to deal and jump, jump into that conversation about government. Because we, we is essentially, we have a model on the table that we could apply as a country. This is what we have heard from Nana Prof. And the challenge that has been put in front of all of us is that without the right leadership, this will not happen. Are we all agreed? I just want to you just yeah. say what, and then I, make, I will move on to the next section. I just wanted to make a few comments around industry and value chains. Industries do not evolve accidentally. As Frank said, they are contrived, carefully planned, and developed over a long period. And in Ghana, we like to use the same catchwords everybody uses. Value chain, value chain. Do we have a chain or we have a stack? You know the stack? Put things on each other? That's very different from a value chain. Those of you who are wearing chains, just remove it and try pull it and see whether you can pull it apart. You can't because all the links look after each other. And when one of them snaps, you don't have a chain anymore. You have some strength. So what we have in Ghana, invariably, are stacks. So, unfortunately, the one at the bottom of the stack is always the one that takes the brand. 
So whether it's cocoa, soya bean, mention any crop. There's a farmer who is down there, who is at the bottom. Everybody else, you sell seeds and you collect money. You sell fertilizer and you collect money. You do harrowing and you collect money from the farmer. He hasn't even yet figured out how the rains will treat him. So the rains come and his yields are bad. And what happens? Whatever you call the value chain, everybody's gone home with money. There's a poor farmer who hasn't got nothing. Is that a chain? And then we come back again next year and we want to repeat it. So let us keep in mind that industries do not evolve by accident. They require leadership to be they established. They require leadership. They are contrived. They are guided and given time to mature. So how talk, do we... about, talk about cocoa and milk. At least when I started my schooling in Legon in 1980-something, Legon still had the Amarhea milk farm and they were producing milk on commercial basis. And they had the technology for people to come and produce milk on commercial basis. Nobody picked it up. We don't like hard work. That's another thing. We don't like hard work. We're not patient with work. That is a Everybody is statement. looking for something for a quick buck. Legon had milk, uh, Frisian cows. You know Frisian cows? Yeah. They brought them. They did very well in Ghana at Amaria. The last time I went, we built houses all over the place. We don't like hard work. Let me, so let, let us me, again let go back and understand I want to deal with that value chains. for a second on, on how we can get the leader. Because I think we've established that leadership is the issue. And if we had the right leadership, Frank, Mr. Idu said, um, with, with Frank, we have rulers, or we've had rulers and not leaders. Right. I'm going to make a little bit of a controversial statement. In Ghana, we have two leading political parties. These parties are probably some of the best organizations in this country. Because they are able to go into all districts in this country and deliver a vote that gives them power. And right now, the score is 4-4, is it? So it's tight. We'll see what happens next year, right? What we are hearing you say is that our system has not delivered to these parties the leadership that we require. Is that correct? And if so, what do we do to get a different outcome? And I think that's the crux of our conversation today. <laughs> I'll go in the other direction. I'll start with Nandani, and then I'll go to Pro, and then I'll come to you, Frank. Well, uh, our democracy is evolving. I should say that we're at crossroads. The beauty is that uh, I'm an incumbent, but unfortunately, our party. We are now split into all these parties. But the truth of the matter is that, yes, they have the tools, the organization to go.
culture cannot self-regulate is doomed for failure. So you have a political structure that elects an elects executive president that appoints everybody from Supreme Court, that appoints every minister, that appoints, in fact, immediately you change government, all state institutions, boards and CEOs are dismissed. It's not possible to develop. So I'm not a politician, so I can say it as it is. And I'm speaking on that Chimota platform, so please. <laughs> so please, let's go back and ask ourselves as Ghanaian electors. Development, do we have the institutions to hold people accountable for not giving us the development and for consequences to follow? I'll leave it at this point. Um, you can also be saved because I'm a chief. So. <laughs> Nana Prof. Uh, so this is a very hard one to uh, follow uh, such a distinguished speaker, but uh, let, let me try. Um, so uh, there's some things I completely agree with, particularly the past, last part of what you j just said. Um, what we should be creating in this nation are institutions. Uh, we need strong institutions. We need strong rules. Uh, part of what I've been doing is to create some markets. The markets are institutions economic institutions. So let's try and create them. And in some sense, I think where you're heading is, if we could insulate ourselves from bad leadership, that would be great. And so if the rules and regulations could be fair and independent of our politicians, that would be wonderful. It's always surprising to me, and this is the other part where I'm going to get myself into a lot of trouble, we all agree we have issues with our politicians. Why then are we entrusting them with so many economic projects? There are all these special initiatives. The politicians come and they've got certain kinds of industries and they're all doing them. Uh, you said you were an Nkrumahist and I think you guys do want some uh, liveliness in here. So maybe I'll give him a bit of a hard time here. One of our spectacular failures so again, I am a big fan of Kwame Nkrumah. I, do, I actually don't know how he did all the things he did, get us independence at that young age. So he's somebody who, for me, is very, very inspiring. On the other hand, on the economics, he did not help to create economic institutions. Everything was top down. He decided he would like Ghana to industrialize. He had what was then called shopping list industrialization. Look at all of our imports. We import toothpaste. Let's make toothpaste. We import soap. Let's make soap. We have mangoes. Let's export mangoes. Let's create a mango factory which will bottle the, tin the mangoes and export. But it was all state driven. And my recollection is in those years, they produced a mango factory whose uh, supply exceeded maybe the entire world demand for mangoes. And so Kwame Nkrumah's rule, as you know, was, a, t was a, a lesson for all of us, okay? Again, I'm a big admirer, but the economics did not work. That is not how you create industries. You allow the private sector to work up, and yes, with the help of government, but the private sector has to lead. If everything is coming too much from the government, you are going to fail. So that was a big mistake of Kwame Nkrumah. And if I may mention the second mistake, which is a little bit subtle and something which I saw in our time, we need to cherish our entrepreneurs, the people who are doing. And sometimes we just don't give them enough credit. They are very, very fragile. And we need to encourage them. They need to learn how to do business. After they've done it for a few times and failed a few times, thank you for the entrepreneurs. And so one of the things we saw in Nkrumah's time and one of the things we saw in a few other administrations is just a sense of war between the politicians and our entrepreneurial class. That is not good. You need the entrepreneurs to have the skills. And so in many of the advanced nations that you're mentioning, uh, Malaysia, as soon as a project comes, there are a bunch of people that they know how to do these things. They've done it before. But if in our case, we have decimated our old entrepreneurial class for political reasons, when the economy changes and there are 
opportunities, you don't have an entrepreneurial class anymore. They've all disappeared or put in prison. And so those are my comments on that. And again, I may get myself into trouble, but governments sometimes, even today, we are allowing them to do too much. They should not be micro-creating industries. Yes, they should do the whole chain, but not specific individual uh, industries. They should be built, they should just be doing the uh, uh, institutions. And all of us, please, let's cherish our entrepreneurial class. I am a professor. I cannot be an entrepreneur. I really admire the entrepreneurs out there, and they are a valuable asset for our good nation, Ghana. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, so let me, let's, let's cherish Abusia Bini, Moses Bidi. I see that you, you, you invited your colleague Abusia Bini from MOBA, but not the uh, one from, from Presec. I will convey your, your, your greetings. You know, on the issue of our governance structure, yes, let's create institutions, etc. I earlier on talked about various forms of democracy. We chose as a country to practice multi-party democracy. Clearly, it's not working. I have a variant, fairly radical variant. The problem we have has become winner takes all. So, and you say, why are politicians running institutions? Because they are in charge. So I can take a seasoned tailor and make him the minister for education because I simply can do so. You know, and so you had the educational sector go through all these throws and upheavals and seven years and three years. At some point, you just get confused. I prefer that we should do away with manifestos. It's a charade. 40 to 70% of your budget <laughs> is financed by the world, the Western world anyway, and they control you. So whether you are MPP, NDC, or PDP, or whatever, you're not going to control your budget. And yet, we spend time to go about with all these things we call manifestos. But we must have, and we've tried, we must have a single national development plan. You cannot come as a president and change it. It is not within your remit. You come to execute it. Simple. Now, we don't vote for a national president. You, MPP, have your primaries, kill yourselves, elect your leader. NDC, do same, elect your leader. And then we will rotate. Because then you concentrate the conflagration, the anger, the fights in the party, not nationally. And then I don't have to steal money as a politician to become a president. After all, it will cost me less to buy votes in, my, in an NDC um, primaries or an MPP primaries than it will cost me to run a, a national election to become president. So whatever you want to do after that, you toss a coin. You give NDC six years, you give MPP six years. But you're all following one, one, one development plan. And the tenure of the MP is not coterminous with the tenure of the president. And the, ten, the MP gets four years, the president gets six years, one shot, he's gone. And no MP can become a minister. Because right now, what you're doing is that because the MP is beholding to the president, the MP acts for the president and says, I don't care about my constituents. That is not representative democracy. You know? So these are some of my, my crazy thoughts. But then again, I'm not a politician. Very, very clear <laughs> suggestions and recommendations. What we're getting definitely from the panelists, from everyone here, is that if we make the right choices, this country has the potential to be great. But clearly, the structure that we have right now that determines how we're governed is not working. So, like Frank says, I was suggesting, maybe we do away with manifestos. Maybe we look at how the budgeting processes work and agree and accept that we don't control a lot of it. 
maybe we find a way to put in place a national plan. Let's make it cheaper to gain power because that's where the costs are that cause all the things that we know happen. We need to look at the system that we're running. Do we all agree? We're going to take some questions at this point in time. And then, when that is done, I'll ask the question of the panelists. How? Because if you're going to change a system that gives power to somebody, I don't think that you should expect that they're going to just allow that change to happen. Or it's going to have to be planned, thought through, and executed. So we'll get to that after we take some questions. Is that okay, gentlemen? Okay. And how are we doing? Okay, so we'll start with this uh, gentleman here. Thank you very much, everybody. And, and, and just, I'm sorry, very quickly, um, let's get straight to the question. Um, we've had the panelists speak and profess, but. I'm sorry, through my. Uh, comments, you can be turned into question. We are talking about solutions, right? Yes. I've heard everybody, but we will concentrate in on the top, not really the bottom. We need to restructure the bottom in order for our political sphere to be correct. And let me give it to you. The youth, uh, about 70% of the population, take all their votes, they can elect any type of president but they are not organized. So what's the organi organization format for the youth? From now on, don't wait like a child, depending on anybody to do anything for you. Politicians, we don't listen to them. We're going to be the one to control our representative, and we learn to fund our candidate, like the Obama star, small, small contribution, and with your volunteering, you know, effort, you can elect leaders. And let's go to the lowest part, electoral areas that constitute or constituency. We go there with a new set of mind. Nobody can save us from us but us. They go with their power. Then we're dealing with electing people that we control because we dictate the narrative. Because we fund it ourselves and we can so they become our servant. We can get what we want. So when we get there in different constituencies, we form the majority in the parliament. President has to bow to us because we've got the power in our hand. We're talking about how to raise power, not just talking. Something we can go back tomorrow and start doing, and we'll start getting there. But when we talk all this, when we go home, we sleep on it, that's the end. I'm going back to my constituent to start organizing towards that. So it starts from the bottom to change the political structure. We're not dealing with MPP, NDC. We are going with independent candidates. Thank candidates you very much. Candidates will be independent. So we change that structure. Then we bring power into place to elect our representative. We tell them what to do and they are ours. That's the, that's the way we can Thank you. I cry yeah. out and then. Um, <laughs> Nan Danny, you said any institution that cannot self regulate is bound for failure. To that, I'll say there's another saying politicians control the ordinary man, and those who control the money control them both. We live in a country where it's easier to get a loan for a funeral than education or business. So maybe the reason why we don't have all of these industries is not so much political leadership, but because our capital markets have been perverted, chasing easy money from T-bills. And we know who controls that, right? So maybe it's the banks and the capital markets. They haven't allocated capital properly. Um, 
All right, thank you very much. Um, I think one of the, it's a question, but in the form of contribution as well. Um, in the first place, in fact, this is very important, particularly because it looks like uh, much of the solution we are preferring today is political. And so sometimes it's very important that uh, we put the conversation in the right context. And I like the fact that um, the question was asked, for what reason do we give power? I mean, this is so critical because as a politician, I've seen various reasons why people give power. And until the citizenry changes the reason for which they give power, nothing is going to change. So if you are going even for, we, are, we have an upcoming assembly election, how many people um, who are very educated and very experienced and who are industry players give themselves up for assembly elections? How many of us in this room would ever think of becoming an assembly member? And so we leave the space for people who are not very experienced, who don't have, I mean, the, the knowledge and the desire to really build this country. And so you go some, excuse me, very popular drunkard in the community goes round and everybody say, oh, honorable toko kumayen, honorable yewe mayen, honorable one toko kwa min too, and all that. And so the honorable member who takes decision in the local assembly with respect to your roads, your drains, the, your, 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 your planning, goes there only because he gives someone, I mean, one city or two city of cocoa. So there is a structural change that we need as a people. So you, and agree, I agree. you agree with us? No, no, and I do agree, particularly with the fact that the type of democracy we are experiencing or we are using now would not work. I think that we need a new African modeled democracy. And uh, even though I don't agree that uh, we don't need manifestos, because even when we have a national development plan, every political party will have to tell us how they intend achieving those plans. And that would still come out of their manifesto that they are going to profess. And so I think that to a very large extent, indeed, we have a country that is in crisis. If we would define a new economic model, that would be leadership. I don't believe we need 275 members of parliament. I don't believe that we need a whole structure known as Council of State that we pay. I don't believe that all those VAs that we volunteer every four years with this ex gratia we need to do that. Because if you're a country where you produce, let's say, 100 Ghana cities, and you are spending 200 Ghana cities, and you always have to borrow to finance your deficit, how do you grow a country like that? So I agree that it's political, and we need to change our political structure to get a solution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The name is Victor Achimo Obeng, Achimo 65 year group. I do appreciate the comments you've been making, and I think they are very insightful. But one of the things that I feel is missing is the aspect of executing policy. And I, I do like your comment about institutions that are not self regulating will fail. The only way you self regulate an institution that from the top of the, of the institution to the bottom person, if they don't execute the policy, the institution will fail. Now, some of you here probably are entrepreneurs, and you've hired some very brilliant people to work for you, and you found out that they were siphoning your revenue away, and you sacked them, and in some cases, they did such a good job that your company failed, right? You've known some of those people. So, the, I mean, and you haven't made that point, and I, I thought I, 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 these are very great points that you're making, but my, my experience is this. If you have a leader and you don't have followers who have embraced the leadership vision, you're not going anywhere. Today, I was at uh, uh, 
one of uh, ECG's office. I won't mention which one. And they had a poster there, a quotation from Gandhi. And they said, the quotation said, the customer is primary. Now, let me ask you the question. How many of you think that when you go to ECG office that you are considered a primary? <laughs> See, so this is the issue. I mean, they have a great policy, but the people who are out there uh, implementing those policies don't believe in those policies. They, their heart is not in there. So how do you address those kinds of issues? I think, I think if we are able to implement, I mean, we have very well written policies. I mean, I've read some of them, and I'm very impressed. We have three million people who write these policies. But execution and implementation is it's important. If you don't do that, you don't go anywhere. Thank you. If you want to comment on that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. I think we have time for one. And, and let, let me, are there any questions? <laughs> All right, so we have time for two more questions. I'm, going to, I'm just going to call the hands that I saw go up first. There are two in the back, and they will do closing statements. I don't think that we'll be able to take all of them. So there's the gentleman with the mic, and then the gentleman in the back. I'm yeah. To what extent do we think that our problem is that of research. Because on the thing about cocoa that we talked about, I'm into water and irrigation, and I chanced upon a research that showed that cocoa consumes a lot of nutrients, and it's not economically viable. So there was a reason parts of the Western world rather preferred we doing it, and that is why we always have to be putting in a lot of fertilizer. There's another question of sugar, where research has shown that sugar, because, of the, because we need sunlight, it's, when you are planting, it's not just water, there's also light. And it can do well in the northern sector above the Ashanti region. So for example, that's why Burkina Faso is doing very well in sugar. But we always look at the water and bring it down. To what extent research, because I was in India and I was told that we need a background group to be re doing research to fund what we do as a nation. So sometimes it's as if as a nation we play football like kids, playing football, everybody running after the ball, rather than like the professional teams where there's a, there's a coordinated kind of thing that goes on. So to what extent do we think that we need research and a background group that really direct us as to where to go. Is that question then pointing to, is, is research important as an input into our national development plan? Yes. I can say yes to that, but I don't have the skill sets to answer questions on agricultural research. <laughs> All right. Um, just one last question, and then Prof will, will, will finish us off. Thank you. Uh, my question goes to uh, Nana. You said, wait, government uh, sector is not self-regulated, so it, it fails, but private sector is succeed. From your experience, what is the solution for the identified problem that caused the failure in that side, and rather success in the other end? That is what we need to learn. And let's be angry and implement that solution. Thank you. Let's be angry and implement a solution. Okay. Shall I tell you why we should be very angry and implement a solution? Yes. Sack all the board members of Cocoa Board, sack the executives of Cocoa Board, and let us be angry and solve the pollution. I just start from there. Look, I have had the privilege, and again, uh, look, um, on the privilege of being a chief and also on the Achimota platform, I can say a couple of things. That, I can choose which one is political, which one is um, economics. And, and I'm not supposed to comment on political things, so it can be just commentary. But coming back to Coco Board, for example, I've had the privilege in my career with Standard Chartered, with Barclays and Stambik to be at the forefront 
of arranging no less than 15 syndications for Cocoa Board. 15 syndications. It was the global success story in soft commodity financing from everywhere in the world, not just Africa. Cocoa financing was a success story. And in spite of everything in Ghana, from military coups to whatever you call bad governance, the structure of Cocoa Board was so insulated that for all these years, I remember my first engagement was for $320 million. I left the system when we raised $2.4 billion. We consistently raised it at far less interest than most developing countries. The last check before I left were borrowing at less than 1%. LIBOR was 0.25% and the margin was 75 basis points. That's just about 1% because of the structure of Cocoa Board. We have contrived as a nation in the last three years to wreck that institution. That is the truth. That's where you should see it as it is and be angry and change it. So let us face it. You know, the other one is, I think my friend there was talking about the capital markets. And we're just celebrating Moses Baden here. Look, when success, yeah, because of success, I can say Moses. I mean, he would be the first to uh, margins and margins group and everything. It's banking that, you know, he, he, you know, that supported him. And I can see a couple of other industries here. Look, when you have spent over 30 years in an industry, Banking in Ghana has not always been on in, uh, treasury bills. No. Treasury bills, as we have it, is just probably of recent phenomena. People have financed the real sector, lost money, made serious uh, progress, and those companies are contributing their quota. But for most of them, it's management. And I think I like the comment around policy. We have the best of policies. And I'm saying institutions that are not able to self-regulate are bent to fail. Because if you have policy and there's no accountability and there's no consequence management, policies are useless. So we have policies, the best of policies, absolutely no accountability, no consequence management. You're given all the, tra the trappings of office, paid well, Ex gratia, you achieve nothing, no consequence. I'll tell you a small story. So when I joined Stambic Bank, we had a few branches, I think three branches or thereabout. But the group, Sana Bank Group, had decided that Ghana was five economists in Africa, they wanted to have a big presence. So when I was coming, my mandate was grow organically or acquire. Given South Africa's background in agriculture, I thought the best bank to acquire or talk to was ADB. And I went to speak to some colleagues there. I was pretty young at that time, this 2006. And I said, look, there's money, there's technology, there's expertise for us to create the biggest agricultural bank in Ghana. Can we have a conversation? The managing director at the time told me, bugger off from my office. If you know how to run a bank, go and set up your own bank. Today, go and pick up the balance sheet of Sana Bank or Stambik Ghana and compare that to, Stambik, uh, to ADB. But at that time, ADB was much, much, much bigger. Today, Stambik Bank is probably six, seven times bigger than ADB. That is where institutions can self-regulate, where there's accountability and there's consequence management. So even as managing director, I knew that even if I walked arrogantly past my door, uh, the, the security guy at the, at the gate, and he picked the phone and called a hotline and said the MD was so terrible today, he frightened me, I would be sitting in front of a disciplinary inquiry. Would that happen in any state institution? Let's get serious. Thank you. We have one more question from Prof. Is it a question? from Professor Diamond, and then we will summarize the conversation and bring this. Yeah, it's a question. To what extent have military interventions over the years contributed to our current state of crisis? Thank you. Frank. 
<laughs> Brother Diamond, sir. I remember having dinner in your house when you were vice chancellor. This question To what extent has military intervention contributed to our current situation? I think Colonel Kutu Achampo was one of the rather more successful and impactful leaders we, we've had as a country, without a doubt, in my books. I think, I, I'm not too sure whether I can comment on Kutuka Afifa, Afifa Ankara. I was, I was a child, I was a child. I think Flight Left Nigeria, John Rollins, missed a great opportunity to move this country in leaps and bounds because he was, he was, he had the power to do so. That is the extent of the commentary I'll make on the matter. <laughs> I would defer to the little wisdom I have left. <laughs> you're, you're pleading the fifth on this one. And, and get to my comments. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, the question that we were given, the topic that was put on the table was Ghana, a country in crisis, charting a new path forward. And I think that the conclusion based on what the panelists have spoken about and from the general audience is that as a country, we are indeed in a crisis. We can argue about whether this crisis is transient um, from an economic perspective, but from a governance perspective and from a leadership perspective, I think the general agreement is that we do have a challenge that we need to fix. We have heard that we give power for the wrong reasons. We have a system that is not accountable and not self-regulating. It is a winner-take-all system. Our political parties are very well organized to gain power. And the things that they need to do to maintain the power are things that are not in the interest of us as citizens of the country. So what do we do? Where do we go from here? This has been a lot of talk. Economic talk, leadership talk. But what are the actions that we need to take as people so that going away from here, there are certain points, things, actions, decisions, involvement, contributions that we can all make. Frank, you're sitting to my right. I'll give you a minute to summarize that and then we'll move along. And this is around action. Points that we need to take from this conversation. Things that we need to organize. We are not the children of Ghana. We are the parents of Ghana because we do not have the Ghana that we want yet. So collectively we must come together to give birth to the Ghana that we want. Apologies, Chinua Achebe, roughly paraphrased. We need a hard reset. The country's problems are not economic. We have lost our empathy. We have lost our compassion. We have lost our love for country. You know, and we have lost our spirit of volunteerism. We cannot continue like this. So to fix it, we need leadership that will deal with the psyche of the people. We are not going to be able to get that leadership through this current process of governance. So, Nana Prof, Chairman, it was your baby at the time. I'm not sure whether we are able to change this constitution to reflect what it should be so we can drive this nation forward. But we have to start from somewhere. How we change this constitution, because I guarantee you, even me, as kind and as fair as I think I am, if I get into that position of executive presidency and the power that it puts in my arms, I am sure I will be corrupted. So how do we change this? How we change this is we have to begin the process 
of getting the powers that be to change this constitution and get a governance structure that will galvanize all together to believe in Ghana as a country, to love our country, and to work for our country so that we'll have the country that we need to, to, that we need to give birth to. Now, Danny, do you agree? I absolutely agree with everything Frank has said. And for me, my refrain is effective self-regulation. Sometimes we take ourselves very seriously. But I don't know who knows the turnover of, um, let's take one of the newest companies, the turnover of, let's say, um, what's the name of Elon Musk's company? Tesla. What's the turnover of Tesla? Runs into a couple of billions and billions of dollars. That's over and above the total GDP of Ghana. Just one company. If we take the top 500 companies, maybe the top 100, they have 10 over several multiples the GDP of Ghana. That's a simple company. Self-regulating, producing great value for the world. And we're saying 35 million people cannot self-regulate and just look after ourselves. Let's create institutions that will self-regulate and we have clear development agenda that people will be put in charge and if they perform well, we celebrate them. If they don't perform well, there are consequence management. So, now, Danny, who leads this effort? Come again? Who leads this effort? I think it comes back to... Um, Nana Prof and the constitution you wrote for us. <laughs> I still can't bring myself, that's my, my father, so um, <laughs> I'm allowed to, nobody else is allowed to address him. You know, I'm son. So, we, so will, we will hand this thing over to Nana Prof in his I think that it's about, tick. you know, you cannot have a situation where a single person is elected president and before he has to make 6,000 plus appointments. Thank you. Thank for you institutions much. that if they don't fit, succeed, nothing happens. No. Uh, Nana Prof, we have to look at it again. So, thank you. Nana Prof on the stage, do you have any closing remarks for us? Yeah, so um, I'm not a political scientist, and so I'm not going to make too many uh, statements about that. But yes, I think... Um, Accountability is important. Uh, Self-regulating is important. One of the things I like to do is uh, educate particularly the youth. So uh, there was a gentleman who was talking about the young people. And I think just having that conversation with the youth, that there needs to be responsibility. If somebody is doing something bad, speak up. I think too many times, you know, somebody is being corrupt in our own family, but they're bringing in money. We, the family members, need to say to that person, you know, we don't want to take your money. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Nana Prof. This is a message to all of us. <laughs> we have heard you. <laughs> thank you. So on that note, um, I'd like to bring this panel to a close. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And We promise that next time we will have a lady on the panel. Thank you very much. This has been a refreshingly honest and stimulating conversation. We've had engagements of mind, stimulating thoughts, agility of thought. Thank you very, very much. At this point, I would like to call Accra Nana SKB Asante for your closing remarks, please. Thank you. <clears throat> well, We've had a very stimulating day. Let's get back to the topic. <coughs> Defining a new economic direction. 
not a constitutional review. <laughs> and on that topic, I would like to commend and applaud our speaker. He has a, <clears throat> provided us with a very refreshing approach to reviving our economy, relying on the resources that are available to us. For some time, we have been preaching, you know, industrialization. Of course, that is, would be great. But his Kumau project making use of the land available, developing farms, getting our, our youth into agriculture, you know, developing tourism, art, making use of our ancient institutions like the stool room, you know, and ancient uh, palaces and so forth. Um, comparisons, certainly, uh, with, with other countries, which without resources, you know, have made such great strides. It's very refreshing. On the question of the Constitution, I would like to point out, ladies and gentlemen, that the Constitution is sometimes blamed for many things that it is not really responsible for. The Constitution is not responsible for the incidence of corruption. The Constitution is not responsible for the absence of patriotism. The Constitution <coughs> inspires <coughs> and discourses accountability. Yes, there is accumulation of powers a <coughs> vessel in the president. But ladies and gentlemen, I would like to re remind you that many of the powers, presidential powers that we complained about were actually taken from the 1979 Constitution. This is the first time that we've had a sustained constitutional rule for 30 years. And yes, we have seen all the evils of some of the things which <clears throat> go on. Um, and I distinguish between political culture and the actual text of the Constitution. Because it is my submission that the winner takes all is not a result of the constitutional structure. It's not. It is a result of copying the kind of political culture that we see in the US and in the UK. In other European countries, they have coalition systems. They have a more consensual approach to politics. And I agree with some of the panelists who say that we must have a development plan. If you look at the Asian countries, Malaysia, South Korea, certainly China, they <coughs> developed as a result of a series of economic development plans, which they sustained throughout. They believed in meritocracy and appointed the right people. Look at China wiping poverty from millions of people. So, <clears throat> yes, some aspects of the Constitution which we have um, noted may be deplored, but there is not one provision in the Constitution which says that when we have an election and a, a president is appointed, all the ministers must come from one, par one party, all the jobs should go to one part of the, uh, the country, and so forth and so on. 
This is not written in the Constitution. It's a part, it's a result of a, a faulty political culture. And I will remind you, ladies and gentlemen, that it was the Presidential Transition Act of 2020, 2012, which for the first time introduced the idea that upon the inauguration of a new president, all directors of statutory corporations will be removed. The two parties got together after the Constitution to do that. That is partisanship at its worst. And it's not the result of the Constitution. It's as a matter of fact, <clears throat> when that act was passed, it actually affected chief executives of statutory corporation, and the, it was the Supreme Court of Ghana which held that that was unconstitutional. So there are many things that we have to do. But I concede that <clears throat> if you have a constitutional system and if you have democracy and you, you, know, you revel in the fact that you have freedom of expression and so forth and so on, but your people do not have economic benefits, eventually your democratic order will suffer. This is something which has been observed around. Um, it was actually remarked, uh, it's a subject of a remark by uh, Amanta Power, you know, United US aid director, who said democracy was failing because if instead of democratic regimes, you know, ensuring that their people have benefits, they have schools to go to, they have all the things which make the, <laughs> the emphasis is on, uh, you know, elections, human rights, and so forth and so on. So I do agree that you may have a democratic regime, but if the economic benefits are not evident, you will eventually, uh, the system will not be sustained. So when some of the young people are talking about change the system. Um, technically, in my view, it is not the Constitution. It is the abuse of the Constitution. It's the fact that they are not delivering, you know, the economic welfare that people expect. And that is what we need right now. When democracy is faced... Exciting one. A very important one, because it's all about our future. And we needed people who could do justice to the discussion. And we're lucky to have these gentlemen that you find seated in front of you. As you know, uh, uh, the OA president did tell you that we do two a year. Finding the right topic, which is something that everybody wants to talk about, and finding the right people are very tough. A lot of people don't know it, but we get so many refusals that we sometimes despair. <laughs> and yet, we do know that there are people who are strong and brainy and are prepared to come and speak, even at the risk of their own lives, almost. Now, and Danny, you are safe. <laughs> After all, this is the speech. We will carry the boat for you. So, my job now, my fear, is, of course, is that we finish the job. But my job to really finish the job is to thank these gentlemen and affordably. I was going to say that, as I told you, finding people to come and speak is tough. This year we struggled, we went through many ladies, and the ladies did not stand up to their task. Sorry, oh. So hope, hopefully, uh, next year, 
you make yourselves available when we come and speak to you. 2012 certificate. It is my pleasure to present a token, a certificate that shows that we here who came to listen to these gentlemen are very pleased with what they have done and we're giving them this to recognize our uh, appreciation. Normally, I would ask a few people to come and join me to give away the certificates, but I looked at the time and it's already 8.30. So I'm going to have just one person to come and join me here to give away the certificates. And uh, since this is actual to speaks, our platform, I thought I should ask the headmaster of the school, Ashmolta School, the school of whom we boast. So come and join me. Do you have anything you want to say? No? I was asking the headmaster if there was something he wanted to, to say on this occasion. So now, the first certificate we'll give is to the chairman of the whole occasion tonight, Prof uh, uh, Nan Professor Nana SKB Asante. Okay. And if you come to the, to the middle, then you can hand it there. <laughs> Nana, let us. Don't go. And then, of course, we were all wondering how our guest speaker was going to tackle this topic and leave us with something to think about. And I think you agree that his approach was strange but good. <laughs> because he chose an avenue that made us start thinking, rather than just come and listen and say, oh, kasa, pa, no. <laughs> Made us think, and I thank you very much for that, because a lot of people now know who, who, uh, what Kume Wu is. <laughs> and so if, God willing, we will present the certificate to Professor Yao Nyako to acknowledge the good work that he has done tonight. Thank you very much. And then to the three strong men. And I'll start with uh, Na and Dani. We appreciate it. We are very pleased that you came because your contribution has been, has been also very good. Yeah. So, please accept this token on our behalf in appreciation. And of course, our young Frank. <laughs> Frank has a lot of experience. His job has made him meet a lot of people at all levels of society, and therefore, you, you, can, you could tell that he was talking from a lot of experience with the ordinary person. Frank, we thank you for bringing that to the discussion. And the younger. <laughs> the clever one. But this indefatigable man who had to do the job of a panelist and also the moderator. Thank you very much, Mr. Kofifin. Sorry? Okay, so let me then thank all of you very much for accepting to come and listen to the Ashwoda Speaks program. Yes, thank you very much. I now hand over, I now hand over to you. Uh, prayer warrior. 
Thank you, Accra Akun. May I invite Mr. President up stage as well? Ladies and gentlemen, can we bow our heads for a very short word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to listen, to learn, to unlearn, and to relearn. We pray that as we go from here, we will have minds that are humble enough to consider the changes that are necessary for forward progress for our beloved country. And for all of us, may we in our individual ways flow out and fulfill our mandate to be living waters to a thirsty land. Amen. Thank you very much, Baba. And I'll add my voice to say a final big thank you to each and every one of you. And I'll ask that you kindly rise with me to sing two very important songs before we leave. Ladies and gentlemen, we have refreshments outside for sale. Special thank you to all Donna Cruz who joined us today. Like I said, Achimoto Speaks is a national conversation. Let's keep talking. Thank you very much and good night.